there's indication, at least in early animal research, that if you're taking a polar lipid, like those that we produce at Orlo, or a, um, a monoglyceride, that people with ApoE4 genome type are having an easier time integrating those omega-3s into the brain and eyes. I love it. And yeah, the omega fats, I mean, it's so essential and it's so often we miss it. And a lot of times people, I find they say to me, they might even know that taking omegas is good for them, but they don't know a good, they're like, what should I take? I'm afraid to get toxins or, you know, that it's not going to be a beneficial form. And so to be able to be able to trust, oh, here's a really good source you can that's going to help and not cause a problem then i think you know that's going to be huge for people welcome to nutrition without compromise a podcast brought to you by orlo nutrition we believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet join natural products veteran karina belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. Today, we're going to wrap up our discussion around stress for Stress Awareness Month, coverage that is what I should probably call our pièce de la résistance, as the French would say. Call it the icing on our proverbial cake. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Donnie Wilson. Dr. Donnie is a naturopathic doctor, certified professional midwife, certified nutrition specialist, and best-selling author of Master Your Stress, Reset Your Health. And if you haven't picked this book up, I encourage you to do so. It is an incredible read with very practical tips. Now, for more than 22 years, she has helped thousands of patients overcome health challenges and achieve wellness by using specific strategies that address the whole body and ultimately resolve the underlying causes of distress. Dr. Donnie herself suffered from migraines for over 20 years, and in the process of solving them, she developed her stress recovery protocol. Dr. Donnie brings awareness to the impact of stress on our health and how it is possible to recover from burnout and set ourselves up so that we don't experience it again. She has been featured in the media and at public and professional events for a long, long time now. You can find her blog, podcast, etc. Her blog is called How Humans Heal and her self-care program on Dr. Donnie com and that's d o n i doctor spelled d o c t o r d o n i dot com. Now, before I bring her on, I want to remind all of you that this show is offered for education and entertainment purposes only. We are here to inform, but if you have specific health concerns, you'll want to connect with a qualified medical professional, and perhaps that's even Dr. Donnie herself. Dr. Donnie Wilson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I have to say, I'm so thrilled that Dr. Sean Tasson put us in touch. I've so enjoyed collaborating with him thus far and getting a chance now to listen to your podcast, some of your guest appearances and get about halfway through your book. I have to say, I'm quite primed and excited for this conversation today. I, I would like to start first by learning a little bit more about that origin story that you have. Um, really, what brought you into naturopathic medicine and how you've, you know, used your personal experience with battling migraines to really inform your work. Thank you so much for asking. And even my inspiration in this direction of natural healing started from my childhood. I, my father was a pharmacist. And so I, I grew up in the pharmacy and always a, around the pharmaceutical industry. Um, at the same time, my mom is a special education teacher. And so my mom would I remember say to me as a kid, as if she was explaining to me what was going on in the day, for example, she would say, oh, that person is stressed. Or maybe she would say to me, I seem stressed. And so I had this concept of feeling stressed in my awareness, even from a young age. And so when I went to do a pre-med degree, I was very interested in nutrition and ended up getting a nutrition degree as well. And so I had this thought as a college student, 
what if there was a type of medicine that used food as medicine, right? <laughs> a novel thought in a pre-med degree. And that's when I learned about naturopathic medical school, which there are, I think now five or six in the US and a couple in Canada, um, naturopathic medical schools that have in, uh, in the institution training and followed by board exams and residency. And so I went to Bastyr University and graduated in the year 2000. And so I, even during my training as a naturopathic doctor and a midwife, I was experiencing migraines and I was trying everything. You know, as a naturopathic medical student, you try every detox, you try every supplement, every herb, every modality. And some of them made me a little bit better and some of them made me feel worse, but none of it completely took away the migraines. And so I started off my practice. And by the way, I moved from the West Coast of the United States to New York. I moved to Manhattan right after 9-11. And so I was moving into a hugely stressful environment while just coming out of medical school and experiencing migraines. And, and then I was a new mom also. And so I was in this mindset of, I, first of all, was very curious about how stress affects humans. I was very curious about how we could heal using all of my training and how to help my patients. And at the same time, I was experiencing these migraines and I was trying to solve them for myself, but I wasn't telling anyone. It was like this, I felt like an imposter, like a naturopathic doctor, I shouldn't be experiencing migraines. And so I was solving it, but kind of on my own time in the background. And so, um, but it really inspired me to learn so many things over the years in my practice to really dive into understanding cortisol and neurotransmitters and uh, food sensitivities and leaky gut and gluten sensitivity, as well as MTHFR and gene variations. And I just, I just ended up the migraines inspired me to learn so much that I then was able to apply it with my patients. Anyway, so now I can say for the past several years, I don't get those migraines anymore. But I'm grateful for them because they really drove me to uh, learn everything that I've learned in order to help other patients. Yeah. Well, I can say from personal experience, I think I've had maybe five migraines in my time. Mm -hmm. And I think often people, they call a headache a migraine and it's not exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, getting to the point where I needed to be in a cold, dark room with a towel on my head and would probably end up so nauseous, I would end up vomiting as a result of the migraine itself is, you know, that's never a comfortable position to be in. But I personally always saw it as a marker that I needed to address something in my life. Yeah. And I didn't seek, you know, pills to solve it. I mm -hmm. sought resolution of the stress. And the thing that I noticed every time that one erupted is that I was just taking on too much. Like the first one occurred when I was volunteering at a horse ranch on Sundays, in addition to taking a six week intensive language course. So I was in, um, 30 hours of class a week, in addition to studying for the exams and working full time. Wow. So it was like, just too much. Yes. And that first migraine came on when I was driving away from having mm -hmm. volunteered for the day in the hot sun um, at this horse ranch. And so you're not looking back, you're like, of course, I got a migraine. <laughs> right, you know, and then you learn a little bit. And you're like, Oh, okay. So for me, it was so obvious. I just so overloaded my plate that there was, there was no space for me to really heal while I slept, while I slept even, which is something that you dive into in your book as well. And I want to point to this because it spoke to me. Um, when I read your book and you actually are saying, look, I wrote a book about um, sleeplessness or insomnia, but I didn't do that until I was able to get seven and a half hours of sleep a night so that you had proven that you could conquer it in yourself first yeah. and could therefore confidently stand behind this work that you had put into the world. So yeah. it's, that really speaks to me. It, it means that you're coming from a very genuine place. Like you're, you're going first to solving it for yourself before you feel comfortable enough to really kind of share that with the greater world. So yeah, I really do feel that way. Like I, I'm so inspired to write and help people, but I feel very strongly like I'm going to try it on myself first and I'm going to be walking the talk before I encourage anyone else to walk that same path, you know, like, so yeah, I really, I really do 
everything I write about, I've, it's because I've tried it on myself and found that it was helpful. And then I've tried it with my patients and had their feedback that it was helpful. And I think that that's missing in a lot of healthcare. Um, even in the natural medicine world, sometimes that's missing, right? Sometimes we hear things, oh, you should do this, but is the person saying it actually doing it themselves? Right. Mm-hmm. So point blank question. Yeah. Is stress the root cause of migraines? I would say yes. I mean, the thing is, is that I look at it as no matter what health issue we're looking at, whether migraines or autoimmunity or anything, we know that it's a combination of genetics and stress exposure. It's it's always comes down to that when you because the stress is not just psychoemotional stress. I'm referring to stress as also infections as a stress, toxins as a stress lack of sleep as a stress, right? So if we would see that anything that's happening in our environment, it that's not healthy for our bodies is stress. And the genetics is the other piece. And but while researching genetics, what I found is that genetics actually plays very much less of a role than we would think. We used to think that genetics was 100% of the determiner of our health. And now we know that genetics is less than 10% of the determinant of the health outcome that we're experiencing. Genetics does play a role. But what's also so interesting is what turns on our genetic predispositions is stress. So it's right back to stress again. So yes, if you say to me, hey, what's the main cause of any health issue? I'm going to say it's mostly stress. There's only a small percentage of it that's genetics. Well, and sometimes eating a food that is not right for your body that creates stress as well. It's an inflammatory response in your body, which creates more stress, which creates more cortisol. And so what do you do in those situations? You have to address the stress. So let's talk about this for a a moment as we open the discussion. What is the role of the adrenal glands themselves as it relates to stress and then how cortisol comes into play? Because people can have hyper low cortisol or high cortisol in terms of stress, which is confusing to me too. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is a lot of us, well, sometimes by the way, when people hear that so much of our health is determined by our different stress exposures, sometimes then we almost like throw in the towel and give up. And I'm hoping that your listeners are like getting the message. No, this isn't about, is it, this isn't about just giving up and it isn't about trying to have zero stress either, by the way, there's a certain, there's certain stresses that is a you stress that we want So we're not saying that we're trying to get to zero stress and we're not saying you have no chance here up against stress. We're saying there's so much we can do to help you recover from stress exposure that it's worth putting your attention there. And so, yes, understanding how stress affects us is the beginning of that because, right? I mean, to me, no matter what I'm trying to solve in my daily life, if I first understand the problem, then I'm much more likely to be able to solve the problem, right? So understanding how our stress system works, we have a built-in stress system as humans. It's built in. We we don't have to go get one at the store. (laughs) But part of our stress system is what we think of as a fight or flight system. That's known as the sympathetic nervous system. And when, let's say, the alarm goes off and you feel your heart racing, That's the sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight system making adrenaline to get you out of danger. Again, we need that. We need to have a healthy ability to protect ourselves and get out of danger. The second step of that stress response is when the brain sends a signal to the adrenal glands, which you just mentioned. And the adrenal glands make more adrenaline and they also make our main stress hormone called cortisol. And so now we have a stress signal going throughout our whole, every part of our body, every cell gets the memo, there's a stress happening, and they get the memo from the adrenaline and the cortisol. And again, this is a good response if there's if there's an acute stress happening, and you need to get out of danger. The problem is that it it should turn off. But in our modern lives, we're having so many stresses constantly, that the off signal stops working right. And we end up in a constant stress response. And it's in that constant stress response that we have a more individualized outcome. It looks different for you than me, the cortisol and adrenaline levels at that point. 
So I can't recall where I heard this first, but somebody else speaking on stress compared it to like a gazelle running from a lion, right? Mm -hmm. So the gazelle runs away, that immediate flight response kicks in. They're bounding away with a burst of energy. And when they get out of range, they don't just turn around and stare at the lion and continue to be stressed. They kind of shake, they shimmy off the stress response in their body and then they return to grazing. And it's like, we we've lost that connection (laughs) to be able to easily do that with a snap of a finger. So what types of tools would you say um, can support that or that you find most successful for your patients or in your own life? Well, this is exactly it. How do we kind of emphasize the stress recovery? How do we help reset that stress response? Because ultimately what's considered optimal health and associated with longevity for humans is when we can turn on and off our stress response. It's, it shows up in the heart rate variability. If you've spoken about that, some if people are aware of the ability with a device, you can measure the slight variations in your heart rate. And those variations in heart rate are associated with the ability to respond and recover from stress. So to your question, how do we help our bodies? How do we kind of build that muscle, so to speak, of the recovery response and it comes back to some some things that actually might seem way too simple including taking a deep breath i mean sometimes we hear that when we're if someone's stressed and someone will say oh just take a breath and it almost annoys the person more (laughs) right but actually taking a deep breath it in just the act you anyone listening could try it right now when you take a deep breath you're signaling to the opposite part of your nervous system from the fight or flight. You're signaling to the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve, which communicates the anti-stress signal throughout your whole body simply by taking a couple deep breaths. So sometimes I think it's a matter of becoming more aware of when the stress response is happening and reminding ourselves, hey, maybe I need to take a couple minutes and just take a couple deep breaths. Or like what you said with animals, they shake it off, right? Even the dog, I see my dog barks and then whatever she's barking about is done and she shakes, right? Like we could just need to kind of like, sometimes we just need to move, shake, take a walk, get out in nature. Uh, And this is where we even can go into things like mindfulness, meditation, uh, breath work and, and, and beyond, music. There's so many now tools that we know help to reset, teach our bodies. This is how you reset from stress. Another thing that you uh, mention in your work is the fact that even to get to a more restful sleep can help us better recover more quickly. And I know that you've done a lot of work in the realm of insomnia as well and helping people recover from that. So I wonder if we could talk for a moment about the role that sleep plays and this whole system working better so that we can recover from these moments? Well, the way I I finally realized it for myself, because I was the kind of person, I mean, I was also brought up to like get lots done, right? We have a long to-do list. There's so much to do. We need more hours in the day. And so we start stealing from our sleep hours to get more of our to-do list done. And with that, we're assuming that we're doing nothing while we're sleeping, right? We're like, oh, if I'm sleeping, I'm just asleep doing, I'm I'm inactive and nothing on my to-do list is getting done. So what I started realizing, the more research I read about sleep is that there's a whole lot of stuff getting done while we sleep. And so when I remind myself of that, then it shifts the game completely. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I need to get myself in bed and get to sleep because I, my body has a whole long to-do list of things to do while I'm sleeping. (laughs) There's all kinds of a glymphatic brain clean out and memory generation, let alone uh, all kinds of autophagy and cellular clean out and repair that happens while we're sleeping. And it, and so it be, then it becomes more of a priority. And once we see it as a priority, then we start to shift our daily routine to appropriately give it that time it needs. Now, many people are night owls, right? They like mm-hmm. to stay up late. But you also make the point in your book that getting enough sleep between the hours of, say, 11 and 3, or or ensuring that you're able to kind of go with some of the natural rhythms of our environment, of the sunrise and set, the circadian rhythm, 
Yes. Now, this can be a problem for people living in northern latitudes, especially in the summer. I have a niece who lives in Alaska, as a, for example, friends who live in Scandinavia, where it's literally light 24 hours a day. It can be very confusing to your circadian rhythm. So what do you recommend in those cases where people might be living in the extremes? Well, and also some of us who are in in like winter darkness a lot of the time, then we end up putting lights on. And so we have this artificial light at all different hours or we're working the night shift or we're traveling and changing time zones. There's so many time ways that we as humans can scramble our circadian rhythm, you know, so then it's about realizing, oh, my gosh, we're living in human bodies that are so responsive to nature and the fact that we live on earth that does have a natural dark and lightness cycle. And if we lose touch with that, it's going to throw off a lot of different systems in our bodies. So what I recommend is no matter where you are in light and darkness, look at your daily schedule and just make a plan, like set it on your phone or whatever reminder you need to have, like make a bedtime routine alarm. That's what I do. It's like, okay, at 9 p.m., definitely, I need to be turning down the lights, maybe even earlier, 8 p.m. if I can, turn off, if it's light out, turn out the lights, maybe you need to get blackout curtains if it's still light outside, create as much darkness as you can in your space and at least in your bedroom so that you can give your body, your brain the perception of darkness and I think there's, you know, luckily there's now a lot of ways that we can do that. Same thing with light, though, in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, then we need to give our brain the perception of light exposure, whether that's you go outside in the light or or you put on some light. You know, there's a lot of um, lights that are made to help people, you know, with uh, with seasonal affective disorder, right? So that they get light exposure in the daytime. So there's ways that we can really help to say, hey, here's the light when it's sh when my brain needs to perceive light and darkness. And let's create that in our daily routine. So I'm glad that you touched on this because many people, especially at the northern latitudes, will turn to certain supplements like vitamin D to ensure that they're getting enough of that sunshine vitamin. What other nutrition uh, perspectives or, or things that are of good nutritional support that can ultimately help us ensure we get better sleep? And also better sleep hygiene, reduce mm -hmm. our stress. I mean, are there any tips you have in this arena? Well, of course, when we get exposure to darkness, and I always think it's it's cool to think that it's even when our eyes are closed, even if you're laying in bed and your eyes are closed, but the room is dark, our brains are able to pick up on that darkness and stimulate melatonin production. So that's one of the key things is is why you want darkness. Even I would even I even try to put out and cover oh, any little lights in the bedroom. You know, like you don't want any light. You want your brain to really perceive darkness when you're sleeping. So the melatonin is releasing. Now, melatonin is made from serotonin and serotonin is mostly made in our gut, in our digestion. And serotonin is made from the amino acid 5-HTP, which comes from tryptophan. So I bring it all the way back to protein in your diet. I find that so many people are not getting enough protein in their diet and they don't, they're not realizing it. And so if we're not getting enough protein, we're not getting enough amino acids. And those amino acids are not only important for muscle building, they're also important for liver detoxification. And they're essential for making neurotransmitters like serotonin, which converts to melatonin, right? So you start to go, oh my gosh, my sleep is actually impacted by what I'm eating during the day. Not only that, but how well I'm digesting that food and how well I'm absorbing those nutrients. So when you speak to tryptophan, I think most people think turkey, but you mentioned protein in general. So can you expect a certain level of tryptophan to be in most yeah. animal-based proteins? And what about the plant-based ones themselves? Yeah, so animal-based proteins tend to have a, a, a good array of the essential amino acids. Um, I know we usually think of turkey as being particularly high in tryptophan, but there is tryptophan in the other animal proteins as well. And this is one of the things is because a plant-based diet, of course, there's, there's research on the benefits of having a plant-based diet, but there's also challenges, just like anything. You know, we can talk about, I think there's, this is why I always say there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. <laughs> so yes, a plant-based diet is great because it's bringing us back to awareness of getting actually whole fruits and vegetables 
from, you know, from nature versus relying on processed foods. And I think versus relying on fast food. And, and, you know, I mean, to me, I look at a plant based diet in contrast to going to fast food restaurants and living on hamburgers and cheeseburgers, right? That's the contrast. But then what I'm doing is I'm looking at, okay, on a 100% 100% plant-based, plant-based diet, which I do cer- for certain periods of time every year, I follow a plant-based diet. It's just that I also want to be aware that on a plant-based diet, it can be harder to get enough amino acids and protein. It can also be harder to get enough iron, B12, and folate. And so we need to be aware that if we're going to choose a diet that's a little bit more at an extreme, how do we still make sure we're getting adequate nutrition? Yeah, I, I think that's such a critical point. So to that discussion, to answer, to bring it right back to the tryptophan, there really isn't a plant-based source of tryptophan, is there? And I don't think there's a great, like, I can't say just eat this. Yeah. Um, but I think you, most of my patients who are fully plant-based, and I measure neurotransmitter levels. So I see when my patients have low serotonin levels, then I recommend a supplement of 5-HTP, because then you can you can get the precursor nutrient 5-HTP and your body can then make more serotonin directly from it. Now to me that's to me that's a recovery tactic, right? Like I'm seeing there's a low serotonin, let's in phase 1 of my stress recovery protocol, let's let's address that deficiency. It's really a just like anemia. This is an anemia of neurotransmitters. Let's address it, get that use 5-HTP to get the levels back to optimal. But at the same time, we want to help your body and your diet so that you're getting more amino acids in your diet, that you're able to digest that protein and absorb those nutrients without triggering inflammation, like from leaky gut. So we're, we're, and the gut bacteria are balanced so that your gut is actually a healthy producer of neurotransmitters for you, then you're, you're not going to become deficient again. Yeah. Well, and to your point, vitamin B12, even vitamin D3, these are common deficiencies in people, even if they aren't vegetarian or vegan. So, you know, going to check your levels and then find the right supplement. If you're not going to do something like eat organ meats, as for example, to get your iron and your vitamin Mm B12. Thankfully at Orlo, our spirulina itself produces vitamin B12 in the methylcobalamin form. So it's the methylated form. Um, I want to clear something else up because this has come up for me personally um, in a couple of different conversations, one of which I was speaking to Dr. Joel Furman, um, who is an MD and runs a practice in San Diego where he helps people recover from all sorts of health conditions through diet and lifestyle changes. Now, he mentioned that we really shouldn't be taking multivitamins with folic acid in them. And I want to touch back to this because I don't think people really understand the the B vitamins as well as perhaps they should. And folate versus folic acid, women are still told all the time, if you're prenatal health, pregnant or nursing, you need to be taking folic acid or a supplement that has folic acid in it. There, it feels like we're behind the eight ball. So help us understand this issue. And I feel like it, I agree with him, with Dr. Furman. And I, I talk about this in the Master Stress book because I feel so strongly about it too. I feel like if a supplement company is going to make a multi or a B complex or put B vitamins in, to me, that's actually a really a measure of quality is that I'm immediately look, be looking, do they have methylfolate and methylcobalamin or methyl B12? Because then I know that the company is paying attention to providing active nutrients that the majority of people are going to be able to use versus the companies that are using low quality, less expensive nutrients that some of their consumers are not even going to benefit from, right? So that's a quick check for any of you listening is like, okay, let me look, is it methylfolate and methyl B12 on my multi and my B complex? And the reason is that, as I'm mentioning, these are the active forms of these nutrients. So if you think about it, it's like, I mean, even if we just start with the fact that 
our body uses B vitamins in so many ways. I mean, we kind of, sometimes you've heard about that. Like when we're under stress, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm under stress. I probably need more B vitamins. And that's correct. Because when we're under stress, we burn through our B vitamins so much faster. That's because the B vitamins are used to make adrenaline and break down adrenaline and make serotonin and break down serotonin. Also to protect our cells and our DNA and to make new healthy cells and, and to detoxify. So when we're exposed to toxins, we need more B vitamins too. These B vitamins are doing so much good stuff in our bodies. It's no wonder that we, we run out when we're pushing ourselves to the max. And yet we, we kind of are left with, well, how do I know which ones and how much do I need as an individual? So some of it is related to genetics to some degree, like you can find out I, I with patients, I do their genetic analysis to see their genetics related to B vitamin metabolism, for example, MTHFR, the gene MTHFR is related to the ability to turn folic acid into folate. And at least 40% of us have a decreased ability to do that. So that's why I just think if 40% of us can't are less able to use folic acid, why would we even put it in anything? <laughs> let's use let's use the folate form that all of us can benefit from. And that's just one of the genes. There's MTRR and there's all the other genes related to B vitamin metabolism. And so when I dig in and I look at that, what I come away with is I'm just going to want to recommend for everyone to make sure if you're taking B vitamins, take the active form, the methyl form. And if you're not feeling well, like if you're getting migraines, you're getting anxious, you're getting fatigue or sleep issues, then we can we can dive deeper. We can actually analyze your genes. We can actually test much more closely. We can look at homocysteine levels, methylmalonic acid levels, and really understand what is it that's blocking your ability to benefit from the B vitamins. Are you also assessing what genome type they are, whether it be an APOE 3, 4, et cetera? Well, the APO ones are associated with dementia risk. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes some patients do want to know that. What is my APOE status? But what we now know is dementia is associated with a whole long list of genes and APOE is only one of them. So, um, and even then, to me, whichever APOE status you have, some of these same strategies are going to help the same dropping inflammation, recovery from stress, detoxing from toxins. This is the way we prevent dementia. Right. Well, I wanted to bring that up because I, I personally too, I've taken both the ancestry test and the um, 23 and me, 23 and me, because I wanted to find out how much Neanderthal I had. Mm -hmm. And it also came with more than I anticipated in so far as expressing to me what genome type I happen to be. And I did find out that I have one representation of APOE4, which wasn't a complete surprise because my grandmother also suffered from dementia. Um, and then I also learned that I had one gene for celiac. Mm -hmm. Now I've taken other tests to test my um, sensitivity to wheat and um, to gluten in particular. Um, it was an Everly Well like test that they make available for a couple hundred dollars just because I was trying to assess what might I be reacting to. And I learned that even though I have that one representation of celiac, I have zero sensitivity to gluten, but I have sensitivity to other proteins in grains. And so, mm -hmm. you know, given that I tend to limit my consumption of grains and I notice that when I don't eat grains at all, and I'm going to eliminate rice from this. I don't seem to have any issues with rice, but when I eliminate all the other grains that I just feel more connected to my gut and I can't even describe it another way. I notice that I also feel just a little slimmer there, even if my weight remains the same. So there's less inflammation happening in my gut. And so these are just kind of the personal experiences I'm bringing out because I want people to understand too, that if you're listening to your body and you couple it with a couple of tests to figure out where you might have some like red flags that you want to address, that that can help manage your health journey. And I know too, that something else I discovered through uh, reading research on omega threes and connecting with Dr. Um, Melanie Plourd from Université de Sherbrooke in Canada, that APOE4 allele individuals have a harder time assimilating omega threes. 
And so if we learn that there's a connection between omega threes and brain, and then that you might need more of these particular things to help treat a potential for an, a later onset of a health issue, then you can both manage your health, be giving yourself inputs that are better for you, and also be focused on getting the most bioactive form of something. Something she shared was that there's indication, at least in early animal research, that if you're taking a polar lipid, like those that we produce at Orlo, or a, um, a monoglyceride, that people with ApoE4 genome type are having an easier time integrating those omega-3s into the brain and eyes. And so the more we learn, the more we learn that we really need to be going to the most bioavailable form, which typically comes from food or the earliest point of food, like your point going to the animal proteins to get the tryptophan to then go ahead and, and create a system that's working appropriately. If we're going to algae and getting the polar lipid that exists, that the fish eats, then you know, yeah, we're kind of, of navigating the whole thing. And we can even do some of this through, through vegan means as with the algae. So yeah, it's kind of, it's it. a long journey. <laughs> I love it. And yeah, the, the omega fats, I mean, it's, it's so essential and it's so often we miss it. And a lot of times people, I find they say to me, they might even know that taking omegas is good for them, but they don't know a good, they're like, what should I take? I'm afraid to get toxins or, you know, that it's not going to be a beneficial form. And so to be able to be able to trust, oh, here's a really good source you can that's going to help and not cause a problem, then I think, you know, that's, that's going to be huge for people. Yeah. Well, that's where I've spent the bulk of my career studying omega threes, because, you know, so much of this conversation has already touched on them. Things like production of energy and times of stress, and you need your B vitamins, but your omegas also come into play to create that ATP, that cellular level of energy which is much different than relying on your coffee yes. <laughs> for an added spike. Exactly. Yeah. So while I do feel sometimes like uh, doctors like yourself rob me of my love of coffee because <laughs> I probably drink far too much of it. Um, it makes sense that we shouldn't be driving to stimulants to help us push through these times of stress that we should be, considering how the whole body system is working and ultimately consuming these things in balance, eating a more varied diet. Maybe you have your cup of coffee, but you shift to tea and you drink more water. So I'm hoping that you can ultimately share with our audience your, your perspective from this kind of greater capacity of like how much we should be eating and when, what types of liquids we should be drinking and when, so that we can set ourselves up for the most success, not only in managing our waistlines, but our stress levels and our sleep. And that's exactly it is like how to find that Goldilocks, that sweet spot for each individual, because I think as humans, we're, we're so used to, we're willing to do more for longer. And, you know, so we're willing to push, but that's actually the problem because we're pushing so much that we're pushing past the hormetic zone. Hormesis is when we're, we're giving our body a bit of a challenge, a change, but we we only want to do so much change that's going to be beneficial and create a beneficial uh, effect for us, right? But if we push too much, now we're putting ourselves into this high inflammation, high oxidative stress and being hard on our mitochondria again. So how do we find that? How do we really identify when we're in our hormetic zone for ourselves. And it does take that body awareness we've been talking about, you know, how do we listen to our body signals more? And how do we understand our symptoms that we're experiencing? And how do we understand ourselves as individuals? Because when to me, when it comes to what I refer to as care, the clean eating, the adequate sleep, even the recovery activities, which is even like meditation and E is for exercise and exercise is a perfect example of this. We know that exercise is beneficial, but we also know that if we overdo it, if we go too intense for too long, we're increasing cortisol levels, we're increasing risk of injury, we're working against ourselves. So just really saying to people like, be take a breath again <laughs> and realize that maybe less is actually more. 
for your body and how to start to realize what that is for for you in terms of even yeah quantities of food how to find like here's exactly the quantity of food that I can consume at this moment in time and know that my body's going to be able to digest it absorb it my insulin's going to be able to handle the carbs my mitochondria are going to be able to use that energy you know, and it's going to go smoothly. And if I eat too much, I'm just ending up overwhelming my digestion, overfeeding bacteria, stimulating leaky gut and inflammation. You see, it's just like the whole snowball effect. And so I think it just takes practice. In fact, I end up just deciding that being human is, this is what being human is. It's practicing, learning our, this zone where our bodies are functioning up functioning optimally. And that includes, by the way, cortisol and adrenaline levels. I mean, to me, that's, that's the first thing on the list it, it, of any everything. Like, I really feel like that gets missed. Like we walk around doing a lot of good stuff, even we're eating healthy, we're exercising, we're meditating. But if we don't have an optimal cortisol level, it's really for nothing. It's for not because it's, there's still a, a, an imbalanced stress signal happening in the background. And so it's like, no, we need to actually figure out what is your cortisol level? Is your cortisol too high at certain times a day? Is it too low at certain times a day? And whichever it is, then we need to work on getting it back to this optimal zone. Because when cortisol is at optimal, then everything else is easier. Everything else works better. Everything else is smoother, you know, so it's like this positive ripple effect. And so to me, yeah, that's, that's the big piece is getting cortisol to optimal. So of course, when you're looking at optimizing something, you kind of need to measure it, right? And one of the things we've talked about already a couple of times is the sorts of tests that you might perform and genetic tests and also a cortisol test now. And this is something we touched on when we spoke with Dr. Tasson in, in our last episode with him. Mm -hmm. um, he shared that he likes to, I believe, do saliva tests because you can perform them many times throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You need to check at specific waypoints. So <clears throat> what is your perspective when it comes to how best to test for stress, when to test for the cortisol specifically. And then, you know, about what does this cost and how do people ask for it? How do they access this sort of a test? Well, we can, you can test cortisol and blood, but then you only get it at the time your blood was drawn. And really cortisol is a hormone that should be higher in the morning and gradually decreasing through the day so that it's lowest at night. So to really get a sense of what's happening in your, with your cortisol, we, we need to measure it at like at least four different times a day, morning, midday, evening, bedtime. And that can be done with saliva. Yeah, that's that's what I usually use is a person can spit in a tube and you can do that from home. It can also be measured in urine. But then we can see what is your cortisol because then it might be just fine in the morning, but it's too high in the evening or it's low in the morning and it's just fine in the evening. So we need to see your cortisol curve. And that is not a standard test. Like if you go to the regular doctor's office, your annual exam, they're not going to usually do that because this is not on the radar to in, in the standard medical approach. It's not, it's not generally covered by insurance even. It's not, even though to me, I'm like this, every single person should know their cortisol levels. This is essential for health, but we have to realize that, that, that our medical system and our, and our health insurance systems are really not there for preventive medicine. They're there for once a health issue develops and helping you solve it in the acute state. If we want to be preventing our health, we're going to need to take care of it ourselves. And that involves, yeah, hey, let me get a cortisol panel done so I can see where my cortisol levels are. And so you can order that usually from a whatever would be called someone like me, a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor or um, different practitioners that have this training. But here's the thing is a lot of times I find that they are, even if some practitioner practitioners are ordering the cortisol levels, they might not be doing the right treatment. So I also really want listeners to know that when you get your cortisol levels back, make sure then that you carefully choose the correct treatment to help optimize your cortisol. And I write about this in the book because I really think this should be general knowledge that if cortisol is high, we're going to use different herbs. Like we're going to use, and there's research on these herbs, ashwagandha, banaba leaf, uh, magnolia root, phosphatidylserine, which is a nutrient. Those are known to bring cortisol down when it's too high. But we use a completely different set of herbs like 
rhodiola, licorice, holy basil, uh, and different nutrients like pantothenic acid to raise cortisol when it's too low. So you have to know where you're starting from in order to know what to take and at what time of day to take it. Hmm. Well, that's so helpful. Now, as far as managing the extra costs that come from some of these um, tests when you're trying to get a baseline and then trying to see where you are, you know, what, what do you think people can expect? Well, oh, I think you asked me that this test, well, the one that I run is about $400. Now, it's not just cortisol, I'm also measuring adrenaline levels and neurotransmitter levels. So you get a lot of information for $400. Um, and so then you're to me, that's well worth the investment, because otherwise, you might be spending $400 on the wrong supplement. It is not helping you any, right? So it's like, I'd rather spend 400 and know, oh, this is my body's pattern. And this is what I saw, Karina, in my research, is that we each have kind of a, a pattern of our cortisol and adrenaline. It's like, it's almost like our fingerprint. Like when I'm under stress, my cortisol and adrenaline wants to go into this imbalance. And by knowing my, what well, my body's tendency is then I from then on I know this is what I need when I'm under stress and so it's not like you have to be constantly rechecking it um, although I would love the day when we can get a cortisol level in a in on a device you know and tells us at moment to moment what our cortisol levels are I would I think that's going to be very cool one day when that exists but for now what I can tell you is that most cases I see patterns and that's why I call them the five stress types those are the five most common disruption of cortisol levels and adrenaline levels so that you can just know here. So it's, you know, to me, again, it's like you invest in like a $400 test, but then you have that information going forward. Okay. So let's quickly snapshot the the five stress types, because I'm about probably think halfway through your coverage of each of these. And I know there's a quiz in your book as well to help people yes. at least get an idea of which stress type they might be. And I was having a hard time because I felt like I identified with a few of them in different ways or different times of my life. So how, how about that? Let's just learn yeah. a little. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know sometimes when I read them, I'm like, oh, I, I, I sound a little like this and a little like this. <laughs> but there is a there's a quiz I've developed over over analyzing results and, and working with patients. I was able to narrow in on a, a quiz that is also available on my website. You could do on, in under two minutes to give you a sense of what your stress type is. Um, so the five are first, there's the stress magnet. And the stress magnet tends to have high cortisol and high adrenaline either all day or part of the day. So a lot of times people assume that's them. They're like, oh, I probably have high cortisol. And you might. But once you go through the quiz, I can, I can talk you through how, a little bit of how I do it. But then you go, oh, okay, am I really a stress magnet? Or the opposite of the stress magnet is blah and blue. And they tend to have low cortisol and low adrenaline part of the day or all of the day, right? So you get a sense of like, okay. But the thing is like a symptom of fatigue, low energy could happen in either a stress magnet or blah and blue. It's just that blah and blue is more likely to experience more extreme fatigue. And mm -hmm. then there's um, the in-between. The, the sluggish and stressed has high cortisol with low adrenaline. And the tired and wired has high adrenaline with low cortisol. And they have slightly different symptomology and experience in their body and their life. And then the fifth one is the night owl. And the night owl tends to have high cortisol and or adrenaline at night, like either in the evening or in the middle of the night. And so they're more likely to have either sleep issues or, or just tendency to have energy and stay up late at night. Well, it could be related to stresses at home, right? You never <laughs> know too. Yeah. Okay. Well, what would you say to someone who says, I actually feel like I thrive on stress and being super busy. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm stressed, but I love it, you know, and I'm a, or even I'm an adrenaline junkie. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm tend to be a person like that, too. I'm constantly thinking of new projects and doing lots of new things. I love new activities, you know, like there's, there is some amount of that, that's, that's fun for humans. But there's also sometimes an addiction to it. Because if we're, if we're doing things, they kind of stimulate a dopamine release, for example, and dopamine turns into adrenaline. Now we are kind of a literally addicted to stress because it's stimulating a neurotransmitter release that feels good at first but the 
the real science behind it is that in the long run, it's working against you to have high adrenaline, high cortisol a lot of the time. It's it you might not you might be feeling fine now, but based on research and clinical experience, at some point, it's going to start causing trouble, whether it's going to trigger autoimmunity or heart disease or dementia, all of these things are associated with having high cortisol and adrenaline. So we, or cancer even. So it's like, okay, there's a way to still enjoy your life and be inspired and do wonderful things, but do it with awareness for your cortisol and adrenaline and making sure that you're also giving your body a chance to reset them to optimal levels. So we're not in a constant state of high stress hormones. Well, I think you've stated that so eloquently. Thank you so much for that. In your book, you talk about how going too long without eating, especially for certain stress types can create problems, disastrous effects of eating all at once. And so many of us are hearing great things about things like intermittent fasting, and we might be pushing ourselves in that direction and perhaps took a quiz online and said, oh, I need to be a 16, eight or something to that effect. How do you advise people to start approaching their eating habits? Um, specifically, if they are under a lot of stress? I'm glad you're asking this. And, and I, this is a perfect example of how once you know your stress type, then you can use that in all everything you're implementing, including your diet, including your stress recovery activities, including your exercise, everything you do, I would say needs to have with this awareness of your stress type in mind. And so if we go into a dietary change like fasting, and, and here again, it's, it's the same thing, it's a hormetic activity. So if we Yes, we know that if we do some amount of fasting as humans, it can stimulate autophagy, which is cellular clean out. It can stimulate a longevity and so much positive change in the body. But if we overdo it, now we're ending up hitting the other side, the danger zone, where it's going to work against us. And I think that a lot of times people hear about something that sounds good. Oh, intermittent fasting sounds great. And it is, but there is such a thing as overdoing it. And so just to have that awareness for yourself and ask yourself, hey, am I just doing, am I fasting a little too long? Am I, and the ways you'll know is one, if you test your cortisol and your cortisol is too high, you know, oh, I'm pushing it a little too far. My cortisol is going up too high. Um, or if you're getting bloating and digestive issues, because what can happen when you have a shorter eating window is now you're still trying to get the same amount of calories, but in a shorter period of time. And so we might be consuming larger quantities at once. And when it comes down to it, our digestion can only digest so much food at once. So if we pour in a bunch, then we end up just overfeeding bacteria, which causes bloating. And we're not actually benefiting from all those nutrients. And even if it's a healthy food, you're not even benefiting from it if you can't digest and absorb those nutrients. And so that's what I see a lot of times for people who are saying, hey, they're excited about intermittent fasting, but maybe pushing it a little too far, they end up noticing in terms of their high cortisol, it might disrupt their sleep, it might disrupt their might start getting anxiety, they might start getting digestive issues, hormone imbalances, the menstrual cycles thrown off. These are all signs that it's it's a little too much for your body and we need to go back off. Now, really to me, the definition of an intermittent fast is just not eating while you sleep. That's the minimum, right? I mean, we're not going to eat while we're asleep. We're asleep. So <laughs> at the very least, you we're all getting some amount of intermittent fasting while we're sleeping. Hopefully you're sleeping at least somewhat during the night. And if not, we need to solve that first. <laughs> you know, let's get you sleeping at least seven and a half to nine hours. Now you have that much of a fast, even if you ate right before you went to sleep and immediately when you woke up. But most people and this is where we start to, I just start to expand it little by little. Like, okay, how about we don't eat within two to three hours of going to sleep? And then how about you wait an hour or two to eat in the morning? Now you're expanding your overnight or intermittent fast a small, just enough that actually that much already stimulates positive change in the body. We don't need to necessarily go to more extremes. Now, sometimes I do. I just was recently in the Amazon. And when I go to the Amazon, I'm in a, that's in an, an extreme detox situation for 16 days. Now I'm having two meals a day and I'm 
and I'm already on a very anti-inflammatory, mostly plant-based diet, in that case, sometimes I was fasting 16 to 18 hours, but I was in a very different daily schedule. I wasn't doing my usual activities or exercise, right? So we have to keep that in mind too. If we're going to fast longer, then we need to understand that our body's going to need more rest and more support to get through it. And we probably only want to do it for a short period of time. Then when we come back to our usual day-to-day activities, we need to adjust, right? That's the thing is our bodies, more than anything, I hope you hear from this, that it's about helping our bodies to be able to to adjust to the situation and have a healthy ability to respond and reset. That's what's really associated with health more than anything. Well, I just love that. And I think um, the points that you make in your book as well of listening to your body and perhaps you need to eat more frequently or start break your fast with something that is protein and fat as opposed to carbohydrate all help us to set ourselves up for success. And even if we are doing, uh, you know, 18 hour fast, which may sound like a lot that when we are consuming, we might be eating in that case every couple of hours and a smaller quantity while we're in our eating window so that we can absorb the nutrients without overloading our systems. And I think you make an example in the book, like um, you know, just eating a ton of blueberries isn't necessarily going to give you more benefit. A quarter cup, which is a relatively small amount, even just a handful, can really give you the benefits of all the phytonutrients in the blueberry and also stimulating the right bacteria in your gut. Just throwing more on isn't going to do a lot more for you. So I think that can be how, how we help ourselves. Something else that I think I hear consistently from all these incredible professionals like yourself, naturopathic and functional doctors in particular, is that protein is key. And while, you know, going keto may be right for some people for a period of time, may not be the best solution long term, um, because you're what getting 80% of your calories from fat and only 10% from protein and carbohydrates. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's all, you You know, I think any choice you make with your diet, you want to make that choice intentionally. And I always, before going into it, because I would consider that more of an extreme of a diet choice, and you might choose it to try it or for a period of time for certain medical purposes, whether that's, say, diabetes or weight loss, you might try it. But I would always want to start by saying, do I have a foundation first? Do I have a foundation of care? Am I getting good sleep? Are my nutrient levels balanced? Is my cortisol optimized? Have I taken care of all of these essential things? And then say, okay, uh, now am I prepared to, whether it's go plant-based for two weeks or go to keto for two weeks, you know, then you, you're, you're, you're working with a solid foundation. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the problems with keto that we should just touch on briefly is that when you are consuming that much fat, you really need to work to balance your fats. And it's so much easier to get omega sixes than omega threes. So, you know, leaning on saturated fats and perhaps medium chain triglycerides more than something like cooking oil (laughs) is going to be better for you and set you up for more success. And then just make sure that you're getting enough omega threes, EPA and DHA and Orlo provides a great solution for that because they're in that polar lipid form. So, um, As we prepare to wrap, I would just love to hear from you if there are um, any particular supplements that you say are just generally good for everybody to consider taking. Let's see. I would start with making sure you're getting electrolytes, which may not even have to come from a supplement. You can get that from sea salt. Um, So, you know, making sure you're getting high filtered water and electrolytes. And then from there, I would say magnesium is often a deficient one. So I'm like, okay, let's make sure we have enough magnesium. Magnesium helps us metabolize adrenaline. So if you know you're one of the stress types with high adrenaline or you feel that adrenaline, then you know you need to help your body metabolize it or you're getting PMS symptoms. That's another sign. Then it's like, let's get some, make sure you're getting some good magnesium. And there's different kinds of magnesium. I could go into so much about that, but probably I'd be thinking of more like magnesium threonate and glycinate to help your nervous system metabolize adrenaline. Yeah. And in those cases too, they um, aren't going to cause digestive distress. So very bioavailable, able to support your system. And, and then I think you're, of course, pointing to getting your test results so you know where you might have some specific insufficiencies. Fantastic. 
Well, I just so appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. I've learned a lot. I intend to finish your book and um, perhaps even share some of it on the podcast and as a quote here and there, just because I think there are some pearls of wisdom that are very helpful to hear again and again, even just that key thing of trying to get, you know, a little bit of protein in each snack or meal and really searching out those things that make you feel good when you consume them, as opposed to those that make you feel laid and down. Um, are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, thank you so much for, for this conversation. And I love that you found so many good snippets of wisdom in the book. It was a joy for me to be able to write it and share about it. I do also include in the book about spirituality. And so if people are interested on that level too, and even psychedelic medicine, to me, it's, I'm willing to like say, hey, what do we need as humans? What can we learn from nature and our experience that can help us reset from stress? And so, um, you know, that's what I would say is just use this as a tool to help you be inspired. And I love that you're already doing that, Karina. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. again, it's just nice to see so much common sense peppered in with all the research too. So I think the thing I would say to everybody here is really try to listen to your body. And, you know, sometimes that's just how did I feel when I woke up in the morning and journaling about it can be an incredibly useful tool as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. I will be sure to include links to where you can learn more about Dr. Donnie Wilson with show notes, including her podcast, How Humans Heal, as well as her book. I also encourage you to reach out and follow her on social channels. She is at Dr. Donnie, D O N I Wilson, on Instagram. Visit orlonutrition.com for our complete blog, including features that you won't find anywhere else. If you have specific questions about what we covered or topics that you'd like us to dive into more, please reach out via our social channels at Orlo Nutrition, or you can send me an email directly to hello at orlonutrition.com. As we close today's show, I hope that you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me. Perhaps it's water, perhaps it's coffee, as I'm drinking this morning. As I say my closing words, here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either-or.